Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Tom Miller. Uh, hope you enjoyed today's forum on helping consumers and employers make better health plan choices. Uh, what's in the toolbox? Uh, before we pry that open, uh, a few preliminaries. Uh, we've had some previous uh, forums at AEI on how to uh, improve and enhance information for consumers and purchasers in terms of how healthcare providers uh, do their job. And uh, one of our guests uh, today, Robert Kruger, has spoken to several of those past forums. Today we're focusing upon the choice of health insurance plans, another important area, which we'd be helpful to know more, but not everything, more, know the things that we need to know. Um, this certainly becomes uh, a more significant aspect under what may be a, a regime under the Affordable Care Act in which potentially there will be a, a wider choice of health insurance plans. Some of us may disagree as to how that choice is actually configured. Uh, but there's also other ways in which uh, the environment for choosing among different health insurance plans could become not only more significant and important, but uh, greater capabilities uh, in the field. Uh, what do consumers want? Uh, what do consumers need? They're not always the same. And then what can consumers actually handle and process, which is somewhat of a, a third configuration. They overlap to some degree, uh, but, but they, 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 they can diverge as well. Uh, there are several scenarios ahead for what the health insurance choice world of the next uh, couple of years and the decade ahead might be. It could be under one model of uh, rather orchestrated uh, health benefits exchanges as set up under the current health law. Uh, there may be differences in the states as to how they go about setting these up. There may be other models of something like exchanges which are done. And of course we have some past experience with larger employers providing uh, multiple choices of both insurers sometimes and insurance plans which provide some groundwork on this. And also we have the experience of the federal employees and the federal government with uh, perhaps the best model of a multi-choice, multi-plan environment as to what we've learned from uh, that particular world. And the questions that come up are how much uh, standardization is necessary and desirable as opposed to a broader array of choices uh, for individuals. Uh, what uh, levels of engagement uh, can we expect from uh, consumers and purchasers in this world? Uh, what types of competition really are effective and worthwhile in information about your, your health insurance choices? Uh, how do we enhance uh, and improve trust that whatever information is being provided is something that uh, people will think is valid and worthy and, and willing to uh, follow uh, on and pursue? Uh, what's the best means of communicating this information? There are a lot of different formats, some confusing, some better, uh, but you've got to actually get the message across to people in a way in which they can meet them uh, where they are, and there's more than one way to do that than a, than a single tool. Uh, can it work? We have a lot of imaginary proposals, but you've got to have something that actually can be repeated time after time uh, in, in the real world in real time. So what does it take to get from here to there? We're going to start off today's uh, forum with uh, the opening presentation by Robert Krugoff of uh, the Center for the Study of uh, Services and uh, Checkbook Magazine. He's been a, a frequent guest here. Uh, is certainly uh, well-traveled in, in the world of uh, consumer health information. Uh, he even has previous uh, governmental experience on the other side of the equation, going back to the old Department of Health and Education and Welfare days. Uh, but if anyone has a good handle on uh, what actually works uh, for healthcare consumers, uh, it would be Robert Krugoff. So he'll start off and be assisted by Robert Ellis, also of the uh, Center uh, for Study of Services and uh, Consumers Checkbook. He's Director of Operations. It'll be a bit of a tag team operation. We go from <laughs> PowerPoint slides to uh, what we hope it should be, tested it out, a live online uh, experience of walking through what the uh, new and improved health uh, insurance comparison tool will look like in, in real time on screen. So let's start off with Robert. Good, thank you very much, Tom. And uh, I'll guarantee you all that it will improve after the tag. It'll flow more smoothly after the tag of Robert Ellis, but I'll do my best here. Uh, I'm uh, very much appreciated the chance to talk here, uh, to share this uh, uh, place with uh, uh, Sam and Lynn. As many of you uh, may know, uh, Lynn has really done the fundamental uh, work in demonstrating how important it is to help uh, consumers uh, through the confusion of, of uh, making health plan choices. Um, so the purpose of my uh, presentation here, or Robert's and mine, is to describe uh, recommended features, our recommended features, of a health plan comparison tool to help consumers and small employers choose plans that best meet their needs and preferences. 
uh, and we'll demonstrate a model tool that we have developed uh, to do that. Um, and the model tool uh, uh, will help states if they're creating exchanges under ACCA. Uh, it will also help uh, em uh, large employers or employer coalitions uh, if they wish to offer employees multiple plans. Um, uh, and in fact, uh, well, it will certainly work best in an environment where premiums can be known uh, and uh, issuance can be basically guaranteed based on uh, a limited set of age, family size, and other um, uh, characteristics that the user knows and the user can put into the system. Um, but some of the features actually be uh, useful uh, even in other environments. Um, and we know why a good tool is important. It's important um, uh, to help consumers uh, save money and, and get quality um, by making the best uh, personal health plan choices. Um, hopefully that market uh, force uh, will in turn uh, drive plans to be efficient and consumer responsive. Um, and uh, hopefully all that will create leverage uh, for overall health care, uh, health system improvement, improvement of performance of providers, et cetera. Um, so um, a little background on, on uh, consumer's checkbook. Um, and the basis for our recommendations. Uh, we're a nonprofit consumer organization that for uh, 36 years has been providing information to consumers um, uh, to help them choose among various types of uh, services. Um, and uh, uh, we've always had to uh, make it uh, valuable enough to them uh, that they would actually purchase either our books or access to our online uh, information uh, because we don't carry any advertising, and uh, that's, wh that's what has to do it. Um, the, and because we're not in that environment, we have not uh, basically been uh, government uh, funded or funded by anybody else. Um, uh, the uh, online resources and publications that we put out for all these years include evaluations of, of um, everything from auto repair shops to uh, plumbers to various kinds of healthcare services, doctors. Um, hospitals, dentists, all kinds of healthcare services, and also various kinds of insurers. We've evaluate, we regularly evaluate auto insurers and homeowners insurers, et cetera. But the most pertinent thing here is our evaluations of, um, uh, of health plans. And uh, for 33 years, we've been publishing um, a checkbook's guide to uh, health plans for federal employees and annuitants, uh, thanks in ma massive part to the uh, leader of, of this, which, who's Walton Francis, who happens to be in the room with us, um, who's uh, invented much of this and came to me with it many years back. And I said, well, that's a great idea, which I'd said about a lot of other uh, ideas of Walt's over the years. And uh, so, and, and Walt uh, really has framed this and carried it uh, through all these years. Um, and that is, um, uh, that guide, uh, first in print form for the first 22 years of its existence, and now in print and online form uh, has been purchased by consumers and it had to be uh, good enough that they actually wanted to purchase it and come back the next time. It actually had to actually help them. Um, I think we call that a market test. Yeah, market test. It's a, <laughs> a wonderful thing, although a little scary sometimes. Um, and, uh, uh, but in recent years, uh, uh, since it's been online, a lot of government agencies, dozens of government agencies have actually subscribed to it in bulk for their employees. So. Uh, over the years, HHS, Labor, um, uh, IRS, U.S. Senate, Federal Reserve, a lot of agencies buy it uh, for their employees to access. Uh, just one other thing about us, uh, in addition to this, all this direct-to-consumer activity, um, we do get a, a little other uh, experience that's uh, relevant here in doing analysis and research and surveys for other organizations. So, for instance, uh, in recent years, uh, we managed all of HHS's surveys of Medicare Advantage and prescription drug plan members, so surveying about 700,000 plan members a year uh, with the results being used on the Medicare Plan Finder uh, website. This past year, um, Medicare delegated that out to, uh, to the plans, said, no, you've got to do your own surveys. But before that, Medicare was actually running, the, uh, running those surveys, and we were managing those uh, for them. Um, so. Uh, now get, getting to some substance, finally, after talking about ourselves. Um, uh, the, uh, I'm going to talk about the key features of a health plan comparison tool. Um, uh, the first one uh, is a comparison of costs, both premium, uh, premium plus out-of-pocket cost. Uh, that's what we know consumers want most. 
uh, we believe that should be um, done based on the user's age um, um, and other family characteristics. Um, and we believe it should be done by estimating the insurance value of each plan. And I'll talk to you a little more about what we mean by the insurance value of each plan. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, but it, uh, at any rate, it should result in a dollar amount that people can actually compare as opposed to, as we'll see, a lot of what else is out there. Um, the um, uh, all plan, uh, a second thing is an all plan provider directory um, uh, that, that a, a user, uh, so a user can quickly see which plans uh, have his or her doctors that he or she wants. Um, and that's a great convenience anyway, so you don't have to go off to the plans websites and look them up one at a time, et cetera. Um, and, uh, uh, but that provider directory should also have quality information on providers to help consumers who don't have providers or even who have providers and have some doubts or whatever uh, to identify high quality and, and efficient providers. Um, uh, the tool should, of course, have um, measures of each plan's quality uh, and, uh, and its uh, health promotion programs, wellness, disease management, et cetera, types of programs. Um, it should have uh, uh, descriptions and assessments of, of uh, special plan features such as dental coverage or fitness club benefits, et cetera. Um, uh, we find, because we actually do a lot of evaluations of fitness clubs, for instance, and say in, in our uh, checkbook magazine life, um, and of uh, dentists as well, um, that uh, sometimes these um, benefits are more smoke than they are fire in the sense that, uh, uh, that it turns out that dental coverage may not have very many dentists in it and the ones they have in it are the ones who would not get very good ratings uh, in, in our evaluations and the fitness club benefits may uh, cost, cost you actually more than just walking into the fitness club and say, hey, give me a good deal. So uh, also highlighting any um, uh, unusual coverage um, or service gaps uh, we know, for instance, that if we look e even at some of the brochures, the, or at least the summaries of the benefits that you get from uh, the f in the federal employee program from the plans, uh, and in Massachusetts uh, Connector, for instance, uh, that sometimes y you don't pick up the fact that the that there's an extra deductible for drugs, or that the drugs don't even count against the out-of-pocket limit. So we want to highlight uh, things like that. Um, so. Uh, and of course, it should be designed uh, in such a way and have language and, and, uh, and help uh, illustrative examples and so on uh, that help you know, users figure it out and follow it. Um, and so they understand what's going on and can, uh, can follow the process. Um, it also needs to have features that help uh, intermediaries, whether it's family members or brokers, um, the, actual, the navigators under ACA, uh, the, the mass media even, um, extract and print out information that will uh, help consumers who want help. Um, and finally, well, it's not finally, there are 20 other features, but finally on this, uh, the list I'm going to talk about here now, uh, it should have the ability um, uh, to get the user to an excellent plan choice uh, within, uh, very quickly, we say within five minutes or less. Um, and w we say that because we know that if you don't get them there quickly, you lose them. And then they choose plans based on the lowest deductible. So you're beating Geico by 10 minutes. <laughs> that's right. They have to, that's right. Uh, uh, so I, never, I haven't even thought about that competition. That's good. Uh, well, that, that'll sharpen our skills here. Um, so, uh, uh, but we know that if you don't get them there quickly, they they'll pick a plan based on uh, the lowest deductible, the lowest premium, some other uh, arbitrary criterion, which may not serve them well at all. Um, but we also think that the tool needs to have, give the user the ability to drill down and drill down to get a, an incredible amount of detail if they really want to have that detail. Uh, both to reassure them that something is behind all these, uh, uh, these short answers uh, and also because they may really need that particular detail. So anyway, that's the features. Um, uh, I'm going to talk more about the cost comparison uh, and then pass this on to uh, Robert to actually uh, demonstrate uh, our website that does some of these things. Um, but cost comparison is very important. As I said, uh, this, is the, this is at the top of the list for consumers. Um, and it should be uh, uh, a premium plus out-of-pocket cost. Um, and uh, as I said, we believe this should be done on an insurance value uh, basis. Um, uh, and where, where we give the user uh, an estimate of the likely out-of-pocket cost for someone with that user's uh, age, family size, and other characteristics. Uh, we should also be able to give the user um, 
uh, an estimate of the cost in an unusually good year or more importantly in an unusually bad year so they, have, they can get a sense of risk um, with these different plans. Uh, and certainly an estimate of the maximum out of pocket cost they could ever hit, the worst case. Um, and uh, uh, the consumer's checkbook model does this using the uh, uh, Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality Medical Expenditure uh, Panel Survey. Walt actually draws in other data sources as well on this, but um, uh, uh, that's the main data source uh, to, compare, uh, uh, to uh, compare costs. And I'll come back to this a little later. I can say that this is not the approach that is, uh, that is used by most uh, planned comparison tools. And we think that's you know, too bad. Um, uh, and so I'm going to describe two, uh, here the two more common approaches. Uh, and then I'll come back uh, very briefly with a, a little more uh, on the insurance value approach. Uh, but I have a slide in here that actually uh, illustrates in a very simplistic form uh, w what's involved in that insurance value approach, greatly sim uh, simplified. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, so I'll go on. Oh, who has to advance these slides? Ah, I advance the slides. Okay, so the, um, uh, the, the benefit description uh, model is the mo most common model we see out there. Um, uh, and this is what you find in the Massachusetts Connector, what you find in healthcare.gov. Um, what you find in the Utah Health Insurance Exchange or whatever, um, which simply gives the user a description of the benefits. This is the deductible, the, the, the amount of the deductible. Uh, this is the amount of the um, co-payments, the uh, co-insurance level, et cetera, what the out-of-pocket limit is. And that leaves the user with uh, what I think uh, uh, Lynn has uh, amply demonstrated is a uh, overwhelming task. Um, uh, because you have to, for instance, uh, my example is, uh, is a plan with a $200 deductible and a $10,000 out-of-pocket limit uh, better than a plan with a much higher deductible, a $1,000 deductible, but a much lower out-of-pocket limit, $4,000. And, and then how about a difference in, in uh, co-payment levels and co-insurance? It's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling, as Lynn has pointed out. Some people have a hard time with percentages. Um, beyond that, some people have a real hard time knowing the difference between a co-payment and a and, a, uh, and, and co-insurance. Um, and then you add to that the fact that they know nothing about what things cost out there in the real world in terms of healthcare or how likely they are to have those things. It's a real, it just doesn't work. And yet that is what's predominantly out there in the world to help people choose plans. Um, and uh, uh, the other uh, model that we, uh, we see some of is what we call a known usage model. Uh, and these ask the user to predict how many doctor uh, visits, how many prescriptions uh, uh, you're going to have in the coming year. Um, and uh, then they assign a, 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 a charge or a fee to those doctor visits or whatever, and then they run those against the benefit structure of the plan, and they say, well, that's what it's going to cost you next year. Well, the problem with that is there are several problems. One is it's a lot of work up front just to, <laughs> just to put that information in. Um, but uh, an even bigger problem, a much bigger problem, is the fact that it ignores uh, expenses for uh, diseases and accidents and even changes in a therapy plan that you can't anticipate in advance. And, and those are um, the, the very large expenses uh, often um, and are a major reason to have insurance in the first place. And all that is sort of you know, passed over by this uh, um, known usage model. We do think that, that our insurance value model should pick up um, some known expenses. So if you know you're going to have a pregnancy next year, that should be uh, overlaid on top of the uh, of what you would get just if you were uh, your best prediction for the population in general. Um, so um, now here's the slide that I'm not going to talk about in in much detail. You've seen this, oh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, this is sort of a very simplified example of what we would call a, 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 how you calculate an insurance value, um, uh, you know, estimate uh, under each plan. Um, but basically. Um, uh, for each plan, you've got, you know its benefit structure, um, and then you, uh, you can look at this MEPS database or some other database, and you can uh, f uh, estimate how many people are likely to have expenses at the $150,000 level. And in fact, you can even break those down among people who have, I didn't hear, but you could break them down among people where it's mostly hospital or where it's mostly drug or whatever. And then you can do that for the, you know, the $75,000 level and on down. Um, you could do it for every individual in the extreme case. Um, in that MAPS database for people like you. Here I've got a husband and wife both 49 years old. That's the whole family there. But you can do it for a larger family. You know, so for every one of those, you can create 
family, uh, you know, a family cluster um, or a cluster of families that have those characteristics and look what their distribution of expenses are. Uh, and then once you have that uh, distribution of expenses, you can figure out how much you'd have to pay under each plan for that distribution of expenses. And then you can take a, a, a weighted average of those, uh, those uh, what you would be paying under each of those plans. And that's what we call our likely uh, out-of-pocket cost under, these, un under this plan. You add that to the premium, and you have something that Robert's going to show you as soon as I finally stop talking, which is um, what's in the, uh, uh, what we show in our, in our tool. Okay? It's like a seamless transition. I'm very, very <laughs> proud of this moment there. <laughs> well, All th right. Thanks to this fabulous team. Who <laughs> As, so this, this um, demonstration tool is actually adapted from the tool that we provided to the federal employees for years in the FEHB system. What you'll see is actually real FEHB data, real FEHB plans, costs, et cetera, just modeled slightly differently into this environment that we've developed in anticipation of exchanges emerging uh, and uh, meeting some of those criteria for different users of this information. As a sidelight to the actual core data itself, one of the experiential things we've discovered, part of our checkbook life and this life, is that over the last three years in particular, there's been a real uptick in people learning about these ideas in different ways than just reading. <clears throat> we've always had books and we've always had short descriptions and explanations, but there's now a big pickup in people actually using these small explanatory videos and audios, and so we're actually producing more of these. And I think it's being sustained by a lot of the studies that are out there saying that the more channels now of understanding you can provide, the, more, the larger group you're going to reach, because everybody's kind of processing in different ways. And this pickup in video is kind of reflected in the world of uh, portable devices and the like anyway, so I think it's a, it's a cultural event as, as well. So we've added these throughout the site, and I'm going to use one of these to kind of set the tone to this tool and get us started if we can hear this. Welcome okay. to your health oh, plan sure. comparison tool. Choosing the right insurance plan can be difficult and confusing. This tool is designed to answer the question, which are the best plans for someone like me, regardless of your knowledge of insurance. Tell us a little about yourself, and in just a few minutes, we'll find the best plans for someone like you. Rank them by lowest expected cost, and report on plan quality, benefits, participating doctors, and more. Just click the blue continue button to begin. So I'm going to go ahead and click the uh, blue button, and we'll actually encounter here something we're just now working on in the development of this mock tool, and we're actually thinking about providing essentially guides through it. So much like I'm going to guide you through the demonstration right now, we'll ask the user, would you like an audio t guide to take you through, which would then automate certain explanatory things um, with audio files that would explain some things along the way, similar to what I'm going to say. But for the moment, we'll say no, so I can talk rather than the recording. The first screen here is where we're actually building the family that we're going to do the actuarial cost modeling on. In the world of exchanges or other, envir other user environments, a lot of this information the user may not actually see, because a lot of it would be known from the system that this particular plan comparison tool is talking to. We may already know the makeup of the family and the ages of the family members and the sex of the family members and the like, and it would flow in as invisible vi uh, variables to the tool. But for the sake of the demonstration to show you what we're building on, I've, I've left it all in here to demonstrate it. So I'm going to build a, a, just a sample family of four, and I'm going to make myself uh, 39. You all imagine that. <laughs> I'll make my spouse 38, and let's do a couple of kids, maybe 10, 12 and 10. And so I'm going to be male, my spouse is female, we'll make both the children girls. We then have uh, health status. The data that we use to do this modeling actually has self-reported health status as one of the data elements. There's, there's uh, some, been some good research to show that that actually is useful in doing this modeling. So we can use it to refine our cost estimates by asking the user those questions. So in this case, I might say that uh, you know, I'm in very good health, maybe my wife's in very good health. Both the girls are in excellent health. We'll leave them in there. Tobacco use is the next question. In the exchange world, it's one of the rating elements that, the, one of the few rating elements that can be used for the premium. So we have to ask. It looks a little strange sitting next to children, but children can now be up through age 25 if this goes into effect. So uh, we have asked that question. And in that section over, we have the actuarial model to deal with this family unit in that kind of 
unknown area of costs, the things that we're going to model from data of people like you. The far right section says major medical expense considerations, and this is where we're working on adapting high cost known usages that we can lay in to refine the cost estimates. So for example, you know, you could select planned childbirth here, and we actually have a model for childbirth costs that we could lay in and massage the, the core actuarial data in our cost estimate. There are other possibilities here, you know, some large expensive procedures. Uh, we're looking at, you know, major hospitalization events or um, major maintenance drug events, things that have co high costs associated with them. For the purpose of the demo, we'll just say they're not going to have any known big elements. And the next element is to put in our service area so that we know what plans are available to you. And we'll click continue. And we come to the second most important thing to consumers based on all of our testing and interviews, and that's, is my doctor in the plan? And here we actually constructed for the uh, last open season of FEHB a uh, plan-wide, uh, exchange-wide di provider directory that we tested in the greater Washington, Baltimore area. So that you could go in now, and I'm going to put in a couple of our physicians here. Stephen Napolitano is one of mine. Deborah Edge is one of Robert's. <laughs> so now these are doctors I want to keep. Sounds like product place. Yeah. I hope you're getting a fee for this. These are doctors that I want to keep. I want to know if the plans that are available to me, they are in that network. So I've put them in. I'm going to point out a link over here on the corner that we'll, we'll skip over and come back to if we have time, but I want to just leech reference it. This is where we would click if we didn't have physicians and we wanted to go find ones that were recognized for quality. So we say, you know, need help finding doctors recognized for quality. And if we go off into that link, you would actually find people that we've identified in these provider networks that meet certain elements. They're recognized, you know, by NCQA or by Bridges to Excellent or they're recognized for diabetes care, or some they're recognized by consumers checkbook subscribers in this particular area. Some elements that we know make these doctors stand out, members you know, participating in patient-centered medical homes, that type of thing. So you could go in and find primary care and specialists who meet certain criteria of quality so that you're not just essentially making a, you know, picking a pig in a poke, so to speak, if you don't know from this huge list of physicians. But I'm going to go ahead and click continue now because I want to show you this, the, the speed with which we can arrive at results here. And by clicking continue, I now come to our results page. And essentially what we're looking at here is all the plans that are available to this family in this service area ranked by their estimated average yearly cost for a family like theirs based on that actuarial modeling. We actually set the default here in the highlighted yellow column from low to high. And you'll see we have, in this case, 22 plans that were available to this particular family. The costs range from $2,000 to over $7,000. And that cost is made up of the yearly premium minus any, in the case of an exchange, any government assistance programs. In the case of uh, employment-based things, whatever the employer piece is picking up in the premium. And then, of course, the health care costs that you pay, that estimated actuarially modeled out-of-pocket piece. What am, what am I going to have to dole out above and beyond? The combination of those give us our best estimate of combined total cost. Now you can sort on any of these columns as you know, just a practical way to see bottom to high. And it actually makes a lot of impact in certain elements. The next column over is most you could pay in a year. This is where we're talking about the, uh, the limit that the plan is giving. Now we know, and Walt's discovered in many cases, that as Robert mentioned, that a lot of these limits that are in these plan brochures and descriptions have gaps all over the place. They uh, have extra deductibles that aren't stated. They don't count things towards the limit. We actually go in and try to make adjustments for these gaps so that we're giving the closest apples to apples comparison that we can when we're looking at what the uh, real limit are, limits are for these plans. And then that's a case where sorting actually can show some rather startling things. If you look here when I sort from high to low, you'll see a couple warning triangles pop up up there. And that's where we found out-of-pocket limits that really soared off the chart when you start filling in the gaps. And uh, we want to make some, the users aware of those limits. And they can be quite problematic if you're one of those people who's making a quick pick because you're tired or you didn't get there quick enough or whatever because if you look at that particular plan, it just coincidentally happens to have a $27,000 staggeringly high out-of-pocket limit and the lowest premium in this system. So if you were making your pick on, I'll pick the lowest premium plan, you've exposed yourself to an enormous amount of risk 
and may be totally unaware of it. In the far right column, we'll see with the doctors that we put in and which plans they're in. And I can always click on my doctor name, see practice locations and the like to make sure that uh, we got the right one. It's not his brother by mistake who has a similar name. And then in between those columns where all the stars are, we provide our um, overall quality score. We're starting with a baseline default score of the overall member satisfaction for the plan based on the CAP survey. From that default, you'll see we have a little link here, which I will come back to in a moment, called Personalize Here, where we're going to actually allow you to escape our default choices and make your own decisions about quality elements that are important to you. But again, I'll talk about that in a second. What I want to emphasize is that over the 11 or so years that we've been able to watch people use this online, interviews with users, we get tons of emails from users every year in the federal system, we know that over 60% of our users make their fundamental decisions off of this page. And it's not too surprising when you realize that they have a meaningful ranking of cost, they have a meaningful state statement of what their maximum risk is in a year. They know whether their doctor's in the plan, and they have a basis for making a quality decision. They have the top four things they tell us they're interested in. I will say that as we move away from that 60%, the next most likely place you'll see them go is more cost information. Not minimize that. What we show here is a little broader perspective on cost years. What if you have a year where you didn't have any expenses? We, we model the plans and rank them. What if you had a ye good year? We model the plans and rank them. The average we've already seen, what if you had a bad year? We model the plans and rank them. And then, of course, the catastrophic limit we've already seen. And then we tell you what the probabilities are, based on families like yours from this data, that you'll fall into this low and high category of expense. So you've now expanded your knowledge of what the costs and risks are for the plans that are available to you in this system in a very easy to understand uh, ranking system. The quality score piece is something that we just recently started testing. And essentially what we're doing here is taking a lot of kind of rolled up top level quality elements. In this list, I think there's 16 here. You can have things like what members say about quality of care, the quality and availability of doctors and other providers, a customer service and claims handling, on down into more process oriented things about you know, getting tests and treatments for cancer or getting tests and treatments for back pain, elements like that. And underneath of each of these, I will say that there is, my little mouse, um, Underneath of each of these, we actually have core data that we're using to drive these top level elements. Most people, I will say, don't go down there, but it's there if you wanted to see what made up these top level pieces, and it does give some peace of mind that they're meaningful. But what we're seeing is, you know, people will say, okay, yes, uh, you know, the quality of the availability of doctors means a lot to me, or, you know, it is an insurance plan, so customer service and claims handling is important to me. I have a back condition, so that would be important to me, but maybe I'm done with children. I've done, had my family. I don't want any more. So this whole maternity and childhood immunization piece may not be relevant to me. And once I've weighted these elements to my tastes and my needs, I can then resubmit and I've now calculated an entirely new set of quality scores for the plans that are available to me based on my liking. At this point is where we think that consumers can now start kind of weeding things out. You have a perspective on what's available to you and what it's worth. So I could go up here now and say, okay, I don't want any HD plans in my system. I can make that decision knowing, looking at the cost ranking on this page, that that decision just cost me $2,000. We find it problematic that questions like that are asked in other elements, other tools, way early in the process to try to weed out the plan display at the end without any perspective on what those things may be costing you, both in dollars and in quality. So somebody may say, do you want an HD plan early on? I may not even know what it is. So no, I don't want it. 2,000 bucks, that decision cost me. Here, they can still say that, but they know the ramifications of their choice. So I may say I don't want that. I may say, OK, now that I've established my own quality score, I certainly don't want anything lower than three stars. I've decided this is important to me. And I might say, no matter how good the plan is, I know I can't pay more than you know, around $4,000 or so a year in premiums. Then I can go ahead and submit and reduce the level of plan display to represent those, um, those 
excuse me, I mean, I'm clicking on the wrong thing. Those choices in my filter boxes. From there, I can dig on down, as Robert said. Peel the onion back if you want to know. You can run down these tabs and look at things that you might find in other elements. If you want to know about deductibles, coinsurances, co-pays, you can go find them in a tab. If you want to know about certain coverage features like acupuncture and chiropractic care, you can find them in a tab. If you want to find out more than you'll probably ever want to know about dental coverage, you can find it in our tab because the feds seem to love dental coverage. So here you can go on down to looking at it at the individual procedure level of coverages on things from crowns and bony extractions and all kinds of nasty sounding things. Hearing aid coverages, plan flexibility information, and ultimately, I can go into a much more traditional environment and say, okay, these plans look like they're going to meet my needs. I'll go in and do a side-by-side -side comparison of a couple of the plans that, you know, come out of this element meeting my cost expectations and my quality expectations. And then lastly, we always want to make sure that people can go ahead and print out a customized plan report based on these choices. Very important if we're going to be doing this for other people because we think there are going to be a lot of situations where the electronic environment just is not the most conducive environment to talk to folks. You may be across a kitchen table or a library table. You're going to still need some print in hand. This is a way to provide that. And lastly, again, just so I don't skip them over, we want to make sure that every element has ways to understand it. So we don't just provide text pop-ups like I'm showing right now. We have on all key elements some type of video and textual explanation. Your costs for health care include more than just your insurance premiums. Estimated yearly costs for people like you include not only your... And if you'd chosen to take the audio tour, it would be automated. But even if you didn't, you can always go click on one of the headphone links. We and have arrived at your main results page. Let's <laughs> point out the key. And you get to hear me again uh, explaining <laughs> what I just explained to you. This is the package that we've been uh, putting together. It's a, a refinement of the federal tool, and we think that it really gets to consumers to that bottom line answer in a very convenient way. And despite my chattering on and on and on, if you just did it yourself, you would have been at this page literally in about two minutes. Um, no, only one other, one other thing I, I want to just restress is that um, uh, Robert says we, we're, we are troubled by the concept that you have to have people winnow down the list of plans early or that you have to limit the list altogether in the first place. Um, we think that when you, when you have these plans like this and you can sort them, uh, you can filter them at this stage, um, it's not too much to have a bunch of plans. Um, you know, they are, first of all, they're ranked by cost, which is what most people care, care about, but you can easily rank them by quality or whatever. It's not hard to get uh, to filter down. And so this fear of of uh, information overload um, uh, we think is, is, is unjustified and is very uh, troubling because as Robert says, people, if you start asking them to winnow soon or you, or you, rule, you don't let plans even play in the system uh, early on, then you can lose some, uh, what could be some very good choices. Thank you very much, uh, both Roberts. Uh, that, that's quite a presentation, although I was hoping we could get a little bit more toward the, the new media where you would be able to tweet about a plan in 145 <laughs> characters or, or less, or, uh, or friend and insurer, or perhaps poke one. I've always wanted to poke my insurer. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's a good start in that direction. We can eventually boil it down to a couple of nanoseconds for making the choices, I'm sure, in keeping with newer genera younger generations. Uh, our, our next speaker uh, is uh, Sam Gibbs of uh, eHealth Insurance. Uh, he's uh, served as a vice president there at eHealth Inc. Uh, for about the last decade. He's currently president of eHealth's uh, government systems, uh, where he leads the business unit responsible for technology solutions for federal and state governments. But he's also uh, worked across the wide range of the company's uh, customer operations and technology licensing businesses. You have a previous background in engineering, which uh, perhaps you can get consumers <laughs> to land on a plane without crashing. Uh, you've done that with uh, aircraft at Grumman and uh, Hawker Beechcraft. Uh, but e-health insurance is a little different because it's not just proof of concept. Uh, you've actually got millions of customers. You've been doing this both before the Affordable Care Act and we'll do it after it uh, in many ways. So we want to find out what's actually been happening in the marketplace uh, through what eHealth has done thus far. Robert Gibbs. Uh, Sam Gibbs. Thank you. Robert Gibbs, wasn't he the 
press secretary. That's uh, right. Just That's a little right. bit ago. Must back, be a cousin. Back and of mine. forth. Must be a cousin. So, yeah. Thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. And uh, you know, we uh, our company is kind of the uh, the other end of the spectrum. Is um, you know, we've been in business for about 13 years now. Uh, we're a publicly traded company. We're on we're on Nasdaq. So. Uh, our business model, is, if, if you look at our financials, has been very successful over the past uh, decade or so. And uh, when you look at our, our customer base, uh, we sell to individuals and families and small businesses. Uh, but the majority of our business is in the individual and family space. Uh, at any given year, we'll have about 14 million visitors coming to our website. Uh, that translates into millions of policies sold. Uh, we're in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. and. Um, uh, another statistic is about 40% of the people who actually purchase a plan on our website have previously uninsured. So uh, if the federal government would have come to us and asked us about building an exchange uh, before they passed the act, we could have told them a bunch of information. Uh, they didn't. So we have the Affordable Care Act. So my job has been in the past couple of years to go out and uh, not only work with the federal government, but with state governments on what it is to build a consumer-centric um, uh, exchange, if you will. Now, of course, an exchange is a bunch of things. It's, uh, it's an eligibility system. It's going to be a subsidy processing system. It's going to help you get into Medicaid or CHIP program or, you know, what we do is, is these exchange plans. And so um, I was fascinated by your uh, initial list of the, the things that people use to, uh, to make, make a ter determination. Um, our list is very similar to that. In fact, um, the number one uh, list for us is the premium cost is number one. Number two is, is my doctor in the plan? And then number three is, what's my maximum out-of-pocket expense? And I know you combine those two as the number one. And I think the difference is, is um, you know, there's uh, really two ways people come to decisions. There's a, a deductive process, which being an engineer, I'm a deductive kind of person. And then there's an inductive process. And an inductive process, psychologists will tell you, comes from right at the top of your brain stem and it's connected to nerves that go and right into the middle of you and so a lot of our decisions as human beings are based on induction is what's our gut feel and maybe it's because um, we have uh, as we evolved and uh, we had to go out in the jungle and, and find food we were not worried so much about the lions getting us because we always believed that we were going to do the right thing and it's amazing that that process is carried through in um, in, in buying health insurance. And the reason that's important is that, um, in fact, I just saw a study just recently that said that 30% of the people think that they're in the 1% income category. And I think that's just that inductive process is we always think things are going to be highest. Yeah, uh, things are going to be better than they are. So I think the reason that our list of the top three things breaks into what's the premium cost versus the maximum out of pocket is that most people on a gut level not so much worried about the long term, what's the maximum that's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to me today? Well, I've got to write a check every month for my premium. So I think it breaks out that that's why the premium cost number one is it's a gut level decision. Um, and so that's why when you look at how we've designed our website, that's the first thing that comes up. It's, it's the premium numbers are first. And um, you, the, uh, the other thing that's been interesting to me is uh, part of my tenure at eHealth, I ran product management, which is the group that does the website. And, you know, we got really good at bringing focus groups in and showing people new features on our website and saying, this is exactly what I want. And we'd go out and put it on our website and, you know, we didn't really see a whole lot of improvement. In fact, sometimes we saw, you know, uh, less people buying insurance. And so over the years, we got a little smarter. And now we do, we do the focus group still, but then we do the, a, we do what we call A-B testing. So we'll take the new features and in the odd zip codes, we'll implement the new features and in the even zip codes, we'll leave it the same. And then people will, will bet, you know, buying real products about which ones work. And so what's fascinating about that is about half the time the new features work and the other half they don't. And so that's part of what uh, I would have told the federal government about the ACA is that, you know, a lot of theory about what people want when they buy health insurance is kind of a fun exercise to talk about. But when you put it out on a website, and especially for a couple of company like ours, if someone doesn't go all the way through our process and buy a product, we're not in business. Right, so we are right on the edge of, you know, extinction, extinction, extinction every day because people have to buy it. So when you when you have that as your motivation, you learn how sensitive this website experience is, and the fact that there is a difference between the premiums and maximum out of pocket. Me, you know, 
Mr. Engineer, I'm gonna, I love that thing. You're, what you just showed me, I would spend hours, and I would have the very best product for my family. But unfortunately, most people, you know, at least our experience so far has been that most people you know, make a more of a gut level um, reaction to buying a product versus a, a deductive level process. Um, so as we've launched and, and gone to work uh, with, with the states, it's really interesting to see how the, the, there's different approaches. Um, you know, some states recognize the fact that um, you know, they may be good about standing up a, 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 a product where you can get a hunting license or renew your driver's license. But to actually build an e-commerce website, a lot of states are saying, gosh, you know, is that really what we want to do? And so, you know, I think there's been a consortium that started in California where they hired uh, IDEO, which is a you know, fairly well-known industrial design firm. So they're working on user interfaces. I'm encouraged with some of the things that you're doing. I think there's no bad ideas at this point because in reality, even though e-health has kind of created you know, an exchange, if you will. It's not the whole ACA exchange. It's going to be something different. And I think the, the lesson's going to be, and, and I think the, the challenge we're going to have is that the very first exchanges that go live are not going to be very successful. It's because we've not done this before. And I think our decade of experience has proven that this has got to be an iterative process. You need a lot of consumer input. You need to try things. There needs to be some type of a test bed where you can, you know, it's, it's really amazing to me that on, um, on our website to go from one page to the next, um, it's an orange button. And we've tried seven or eight different colors, and the orange button works the best. And we've tried different shades of orange, and it matters what shade the orange. That's just how sensitive your inductive, your gut feel is about these things. So uh, I, I haven't talked to a lot of psychologists yet that are working on exchanges, but I do think that's an element that's, uh, that needs to be there as we move forward if we're going to make uh, these exchanges very productive maybe five, ten years from now. So I've rambled on a little bit. Hopefully I've given you some good information. And Thank you very, certainly thank you we can very have much, Sam, and yeah. we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on that button. Yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You have tested with colorblind people. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, our, our next speaker is uh, Lynn Quincy, who's a senior policy analyst at Consumers Union, a uh, nonprofit well known for publishing uh, consumer reports. Uh, and there she not only works on consumer information, but a lot of other related uh, health policy issues, uh, but primarily focused on consumer protection, health insurance reform. She's a consumer representative at the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. Uh, and has uh, recently conducted a study involving consumer testing of the new health insurance disclosure forms being just developed by the NAIC. Previously, was a senior researcher at uh, Mathematica Policy Research, other areas in uh, health policy and benefits. Uh, Lynn Quincy is going to talk about uh, what consumer. What you've actually studied consumers, and uh, <laughs> I mean, it's good to have it in theory, but it's occasionally yeah. useful to see what they actually do. Uh, so, Lynn Quincy. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, as we talked about at the very beginning, um, I actually think that the information that I'm going to present is regime free. Um, almost any model under which you're trying to deliver health insurance, consumers have to play a role. And they can only play their role if they know what they're doing and they understand what they're buying. And so I think under a wide variety of regimes, we actually have to start with a nuanced understanding of how consumers actually shop for health insurance. You know, like building a little bit on what Sam said. And I actually think that often that nuanced understanding is actually missing, that we still have work to do to develop this. Um, as Tom mentioned, I'm an NAIC consumer representative. They were charged with developing something called the Summary of Benefits and Coverage Disclosure. It's a new disclosure that goes with all private health insurance plans. In theory, we'll start seeing it in September or later, whenever your private health insurance plan renews. Um, NAIC was charged with developing this and providing a recommendation to, to uh, HHS. And, as Sam predicted, <laughs> I, um, I was monitoring their efforts and I said, well, so are we going to do some consumer testing of this disclosure that will be put in front of 150, 180 million consumers? Well, no, no, no. They, the NAIC has no tradition of consumer testing. So I talked to the HHS liaison. I said, well, are you guys going to consumer test it? And they said, well, no, that wasn't really kind of anything we budgeted for. And I was starting to get a little worried as a representative from Consumers Union. And uh, I got, went out and got some foundation funding. And we ended up doing um, three different studies examining, that examined this disclosure. And these studies uh, did influence the disclosure itself. But what I'm going to talk about is what we learned as a byproduct about how consumers shop for health insurance. Because 
Um, we asked some open-ended questions at the beginning, like good researchers, to figure out what they were doing. So let's find out what we learned. First of all, um, when you're doing, making policy decisions or even designing an exchange site, forget this person. There may be only four of them in the United States, the type of person, the Sam Gibbs, mm -hmm. who go out there, they weigh everything, they're capable of doing a very high-level cognitive work. You know, we tend to hope that that's what our consumers are like, but they really aren't there, and we need to understand how they differ from this image. All right, lesson number two, and this is actually really important from a policymaking perspective. Consumers dread shopping for health insurance, and we're gonna get into why that's true, but our friends at eHealth Insurance did a survey, and the survey found that they would rather go to the gym or pay their taxes compared to buying health insurance. And it's really hard to get people to do a good job with something that they dread doing. So we have a big barrier right up front. Second, or actually third, I gotta keep track of my numbers here. Some consumers actually doubt the value and are a little fuzzy on the purpose of health insurance. Robert got into this a little bit. Some of them are out there shopping and they're thinking of it as prepaid health care. And they do a, a calculation whereby they look at what they think they're gonna spend next year and they compare that, the pre cost of the premium plus their expected out-of-pocket cost to what they would spend if they didn't have health insurance. And a lot of times it's better for them not to have the health insurance. And they're forgetting the component that has to do with your insuring yourself against an unexpected medical risk. And I have a, um, I'm gonna talk later about how we can overcome this. We do have some solutions we can bring to bear. But this again is very important. This is a nuanced understanding of how consumers shop that we need to understand. Consumers absolutely want a good value. Here, based on our work, it differs a little bit from what Sam found. They actually do not want the lowest cost plan. They have a sophisticated understanding of what they want, and they want to weigh in not only the premium, but what are they getting for the premium. This is a very expensive product, and they're very concerned that when they lay out all this money, they're actually getting value, and they do want to know what's covered and what their share of costs are going to be. And we heard this, it was universal, over and over and over again. However, they can't calculate value. So there's a huge conundrum there. The main reason they can't calculate value is they are completely befuddled by cost-sharing terms. And this should not be surprising to us. Um, cost-sharing terms are actually very complex. And there's a number of reasons, things that are tripping consumers up. They may be unfamiliar with the vocabulary at issue here. Even if they have, but even if they've, they've heard of the concepts before, um, you know, they have told us at the beginning of the session they could explain coinsurance to a friend. It actually turns out they can't. They actually don't understand them when you ask them to use these concepts in usability exercises. And there's many reasons. The concepts themselves are complex. They may be a little unsure about if an annual benefit limit helps the patient or helps the insurer. You know, they're fuzzy to that degree. And then they have to combine them, as Robert was pointing out. They gotta figure out, if I understand copay and I understand deductible, I then have to figure out if copays count towards the deductible. It, it's a very high level cognitive exercise. Um, we're really asking a lot of them. As a result, for many of the people that were in our cognitive interviews, shopping for health insurance is something like this. They see the, the dollar figures and they know they're important it's very hard for them to evaluate plans, though, because they're not actually sure what the figures mean. Okay? Is that Greek? It is Greek. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, and don't worry, Greek though. Greek to me. Is that, is that right? <laughs> you no, know, it's Greek to all <laughs> of us, and I can say that. Um, and their budget sounds about the same. <laughs> <laughs> the consumer's budget? <laughs> Greek. Anyway, um, we are going to get to a couple solutions, don't worry, but let's stick with the problem for the moment. This is also very important. Providing clarity is insufficient. The source of the information also has to be trusted. Consumers won't use information if they don't trust the source. And unfortunately, trust levels for insurers are actually very low. So if you're a policymaker or an exchange designer or even e-health insurance, you've got to do something extra to, to assure consumers that even though we're talking about health insurance information here, you can trust the source. We had people in our um, consumer testing who were actually near expert level, just a few of them. They really got the concepts. 
but they would be unwilling to make a health plan decision until they could go and have somebody check their work because they felt there was something in the fine print that they had missed because health insurers are tricky. These are their words. So um, there's a, we have a big lift here to get to the point where we want to be. This point doesn't come out of our testing. Um, typically, we were only asking people to evaluate two health plan choices at a time. However, there's a really sound basis of consumer research that says um, a lot of choices actually undermines consumer decision making. Now, Robert made a slightly different point, and I'm going to reconcile these competing views in a, in a, in a future slide. Let's, let's talk about some good news for a change. Um, also coming out of consumer testing is some ideas for how we can help consumers, and a lot of them are actually employed in Robert's, the Roberts <laughs> squared tool. Um, and here's a really key one. And this comes back a little bit to Sam's point. When you're faced with a task that's cognitively very difficult, you are almost certainly, unless you've got great willpower, you're going to take what's called a cognitive shortcut. That could be uh, shopping based on brand. I've heard of Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm going to get that plan because I haven't heard of these other ones. That's a cognitive shortcut. I'm going to buy what my neighbor purchased because she's a nurse and she probably knows what she's doing. That's a cognitive shortcut. Well, hopefully everyone in this room would agree we don't want them using those shortcuts. We don't actually don't want them making gut decisions. We want them to use better information. And what I think is very impressive about the FEHDP tool or the, its latest iteration is that he is, they are supplying tons of cognitive shortcuts. For example, they calculated expected total cost for the consumer. That's a cognitive shortcut. The consumer, they did the math for them. That's huge because cons consumers probably couldn't have figured that out on their own. Likewise, uh, the star rating system, even the default one before you've personalized it, that's a cognitive shortcut. Consumers are not going to go out and look up the CAP scores for these plans. They are not going to do it. Um, the Affordable Care Act, should it endure, or even if it doesn't, these are all tools that are available to us, includes other cognitive shortcuts like the actuarial value tiers, um, robust measures of network adequacy we are hoping we will see, um, something called the coverage facts label, which I'll come back to, um, as obviously we want to avoid that unfamiliar jargon when we can, but we're a little bit stuck here because we don't actually have good substitute terms. And if we can get to those substitute terms, they're going to have to be tested, as Sam says. Um, we see this across a lot of venues. Percentages are actually really hard for consumers, and sometimes they um, cannot be avoided. But if you have the choice between giving them a percentage or calculating the dollar result, you're always better off in providing them with the dollar result because it's much more usable to consumers. Um, we talked about manageable, oh, well, so here's where my reconciliation. The reason that I think you can take something like the Robert Squared tool and display a lot of choices for consumers is because of those cognitive shortcuts. You have greatly facilitated their use of all the, the d disparate information we hope consumers will take advantage of. And maybe that's the crux of the matter. If you want to have a lot of choices, it really needs to be accompanied by a pretty powerful tool. Um, because I would continue to maintain that if you just cast them into the wilderness with a whole lot of choices, they're going to find it extremely difficult to make an informed choice. Um, we talked about meriting a trusted, um, trusted reputation. Um, some other things we have to do is convey the value and purpose of insurance in a compelling way. This is an upfront task that we might otherwise forget to do because, again, some people are a little fuzzy on <laughs> why we go out and buy insurance. Um, ideally, as we see in the Robert Square tool, there'll be a lot of, and really, this is, these were separately developed presentations, but they overlap. <laughs> That multi-layer, just-in-time approach to education, very effective, multiple channels. I think everybody would say that's good. But um, here's another tidbit that is really going to help us, I think. I'm, I'm just going to go to the next slide and talk about it. This is one page from the new, and this is um, a slightly earlier version. It's not the final version we ended up with. Um, but this is something that was originally called the coverage facts label. Now it's called coverage examples. And this is on the new summary of benefits and coverage disclosure. This is something consumers have not seen before. It shows for a few medical scenarios 
A, how much that medical scenario might cost out in the real world, B, what the plan would pay, and C, what you have to pay. When we tested this, the results were absolutely startling. Um, the bottom line result that I want to give you is the fact that it changed people's perception. It, conveyed, it, it accomplished that task of conveying to people what is the purpose of insurance and why do I want it. When people looked at that breast cancer example, even men, um, and they were reminded how much medical care actually costs, they would reverse their decision and health insurance plans should be taking note. They, they went from saying, oh, this is not a good value, I wouldn't buy it, the deductible is too high, to saying, you know what, if I get a very um, high cost illness, that deductible is going to look like chump change compared to what the plan is going to pay on my behalf. And this, I, I can't underscore this enough. This is the same information that theoretically has been available to consumers, but it hasn't really because the cognitive work wasn't done for them. People had come into this exercise having no idea how much medical care costs. So they, a, third, a health plan with a $30,000 annual limit, that all sounds like a lot of money, right? That may, must be enough coverage. Well, it's not. And everybody in this room knows that, but many, many consumers out there don't know it. Um, what the plan would pay. In your typical traditional health plan disclosure, that information is never revealed. And people forget that they're actually getting some value for their premium dollar. This is a brand new piece of information that people have never seen before. And I, again, it flipped them from not wanting to buy the coverage to saying, I think maybe I should buy this coverage because it reminded them of what the purpose of insurance is. And lastly, what you have to pay. This is something that consumers mostly can't do. It is too difficult to figure out what their bottom line is. Um, and it's a little bit analogous to that total cost scenario that the Robert Squared product is showing, but different because it's specific to a medical scenario. Um, I'm going to move on because I'm sure I'm out of time, but if you have questions about this, maybe we can come back to it. I'm sure folks in this room understand the implications if we don't address consumer confusion. You might find yourself with a product that doesn't fit you. You may be underinsured. We know that can lead to medical bankruptcy. It can lead to the underconsumption of care. Um, it undermines anything that is market-directed reform, consumer-directed health care. Those all depend on consumer playing their role. And it actually costs money. United Health Group, it's not a public study, but they looked at, the, they changed their disclosures around and they found that when they had the poorer communications, calls went way up to their customer helplines and, and they're really on board with uh, trying to improve these com communications. And I think that's my last slide. Yep, that's a um, report, the short version of the studies and then in your slides, you can go and get the long versions plus some analogous studies that the insurers did that actually had all the same findings. <coughs> Thank you, Lynn. I, m I must have missed that slide about being concerned about people being overinsured. Uh, that never seems to make the presentation. No, I guess or it consuming too much or <laughs> spending other people's money. But uh, we'll get to that. Well, at, at, at a 70% actuarial value, I'm not worried about them overconsuming care. It's a very precious metal. Um, let me get a little cross panel discussion because we've got a, a bit of a slight conflict as to what we really mean by value in, in, in health insurance. Uh, because we certainly have some demonstration that people say, what's it going to cost me? Now, sometimes it's premium, sometimes it's all in cost. And Lynn's suggesting that, well, there's a buy we've certainly seen this in healthcare, which is if this doctor charges less, they must not be as good. Uh, what do we really know as to whether people somehow have a desire to pay more for their insurance in order to get better quality insurance? Or how do they actually parse those decisions if they tend to be driven? at least initially by cost? Well, I do think there's a, there is a problem in almost every service market we look at, that people go, go into these uh, markets assuming that you get what you pay for. Uh, and we demonstrate it, whether it's auto repair or uh, roofing services or uh, veterinarians or whatever, that there's no relationship between quality and cost, but that is something uh, you know that one has to overcome and therefore all the more reason to be uh, to to want to make sure that the presenters of this information are very credible uh, so that you can actually believe them when they say this quality is as good as this quality uh, and and therefore you can look at you know you, you can actually you know, pay attention to cost as well 
Um, but but uh, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's a big problem. To, it's a big problem to overcome. The next stage on that is when we say this is a quality insurance plan, whether we actually know what we're measuring or whether it makes a difference. Uh, I know we've had past discussions as to what you may want to know is what actually is going to improve your health outcome, which may be partly related to your insurance, but inside that big insurance wrapper, there's a lot of other things that go on that's going to produce that. So we, you might be in a better network, you might theoretically find a better provider, but there's a wide variation. So how far can we, because uh, you've suggested in your tool, you'd like to get further on that better value measure of for what I'm paying, what's going to deliver something that actually matters to me, rather than I just had a nice experience of buying what seemed like was good insurance, but it may not have actually produced the result I wanted. Well, I think it's actually interesting that, that consumers are uh, suspicious of a lot of these uh, quality measures, actually. And uh, uh, well, for one thing, they don't understand what they're measuring. Um, uh, and you know, a lot of these uh, um, heat is process measures or whatever that some of you are familiar with are quite uh, baffling to consumers in the first place. Um, but in addition to that, in many cases, they don't attribute uh, to, uh, uh, performance on those measures to the plan. They attribute it to, the, uh, to their physician and they say, well, I don't care where the plan is on that. Uh, that's actually quite a high level of sophistication. I don't care wh where the plan is on that in terms of my getting my proper uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C test. What I care about is what my uh, doctor yeah. will do. So we, uh, um, I think there are a couple of responsibilities there. One is to educate people as to what these things are measuring, but I think also to, uh, to recognize that there is an appropriate uh, degree of uh, skepticism about that. One of the reasons we're kind of interested in things that are uh, clearly controlled by the plan. Well, uh, for one thing, you know, for instance, they do believe that plans d deny claims. Okay, so they actually attribute that to plans, but I'm not sure that's actually for many people, you know, it turns out to be a very large problem. Um, but they, they uh, um, were interested in some of these plan process measures, such as um, uh, the plan's wellness programs, the plan's uh, uh, disease management programs, and so on, the kind of stuff that some of you may be familiar with, uh, with uh, what the uh, National Business Coalition on Health does with its uh, evaluate thing. And you know, that's generally been oriented toward educating uh, employers. But you know, is there something in there uh, that can be used for consumers to say things that you really do believe the plan might do, such as having a good wellness program? And is it more than what they say on their website, but do people actually use it? Does it work? Does it engage people, et cetera? And am I likely to be engaged by it? Is it likely to serve me well? All those things should be part of the quality measures. But given the skepticism, I'm stuff, <laughs> given the skepticism about these quality measures, I do think it's also important to try to educate them on what those measures are, but to also uh, en uh, enable the ones who really want to dig into this, and it won't be very many, to actually decide, well, that's one I really trust, and therefore that's what I'm going to put uh, the weight on when I'm choosing a plan. And that's why we have this sort of personalization process, which is a burdensome process, but, but it's there. Okay, the, 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 the f surface version of this, and it brings uh, Sam into this as well, is suggests that if you're really good you can find a way to get that maximum yield out of your insurance plan. You know, I've, 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 they, they ran the demographics on me, so I'm more likely to fall into this category. Now, we seem to be a little bit at cross purposes in the idea of, uh, you know, broader insurance. People get all worried about selection and people doing rifle shots to say, I'll take this one, not that one, and therefore the cost experience will be different. What's the trade-off between getting to that level of precision where you can say, I got mine, everybody else will have to take their costs elsewhere in insurance for that unknowable risk. Uh, as, as to how precise that, if it gets too precise, do we actually aggravate the problem of uh, increased selection in one place or another? I think there's, a, there's definitely, that is one of the risks of having an informed marketplace, an informed insurance marketplace, that, that uh, uh, smart consumers will, uh, will, will uh, move toward plans. Uh, you know, smart, sick consumers will move toward plans that have smart, healthy consumers, and eventually, uh, you know, drive up the premiums of those plans and, and back and forth. Unless there is some, you know, contemplated under ACA, some, some uh, cross subsidization from plan to plan to take into account uh, risk selection of that kind. Yeah, don't they hate it when people get what they want? <laughs> I think okay. one of the things that's happened is that there's been a false sense of understanding of health insurance because most people know way more about their auto insurance than they do their health insurance. And auto insurance is pretty straightforward. I have a deductible, crash my car, I know that I pay the first $1,000, insurance company pays the rest, so there's a lot of assumptions of that model 
that goes into health insurance. Well, as we all know in this room, it doesn't work that way at all. In fact, it's quite different. And so as consumers have gotten more uh, educated about it, and it takes a while to know what coinsurance and you know, all those things we talked about before, I think shining the light on that helps quite a bit. And I think as, as exchanges and certainly websites like ours, tools like that, you know, we've, we've been um, programmed for health insurance to have someone else make decisions for us since the beginning, right? It was always an employer-sponsored plan, you know, especially who we deal with. You know, virtually all the people who've had insurance before usually had it from an employer. They didn't really have to make these decisions. They checked the box, they got the thing, and that was it. And so uh, as we move forward and, uh, you know, consumers are going to have to understand what these terms are, and once they get it, then I think that's, that transparency will do a couple things is that, you know, maximum out-of-pocket will be a whole lot more important than deductible is once people understand what that really, really means. Help them evaluate risk. And I think that also translates into providers as well. As well. One of the things I did maybe five years ago is I went to an HSA plan. So I now have a $5,000 deductible plan. And so that means at this time of the year, I am my own insurer, right, for the first $5,000 a year. And I remember uh, a few years ago, my wife was working out. Did you buy yourself any claims? Yeah. I, yeah. Well, <laughs> here's the thing is that, you know, my wife hurt her shoulder, long story short, she needed uh, to get an MRI. And so I said, okay, well, we're paying for this. So I had the doctor give us three MRI places, and I called them up. The two of them, I said, I need a cost. Uh, well, that's between me and the insurance. No, I have Blue Cross. I mean, uh, here's my insurance card, you know. But I need, uh, well, we, they couldn't even give me the cost. Finally, one of them did. We went with that. But, you know, this transparency, I think, is once people start to understand, it's more, cons remember consumer-directed health care was the big thing before, you know, the ACA came about it. Well, that's still important, I think. And I think all of these things as, you know, it, the, the, the decisions about what my health insurance is and how to use it go from employers to employees, that transparency and the processes in place is going to be painful. But from a consumer perspective, I've got to believe deep down that, you know, five, ten years from now, assuming things stay as they are, we'll be a much better, you know, society as far as, buying and using and paying for, for all these health services. Sounds a little bit like overcoming uh, the remnants of learned helplessness <laughs> uh, by being in a little different yeah. environment. Uh, we're going to go to questions from the audience in just a minute or so. Uh, we've got experience uh, under Medicare Part D, which when it was passed, they'll never <laughs> handle all those choices and the whole thing's going to collapse, et cetera. Uh, Medicare Advantage. Have we learned enough from that market, in addition to the FEHB, to say that Perhaps people who we think can't make these choices can do a little bit better. They can make perfect choices, but it'll be tolerable enough with, with the proper structure. Well, you want to uh, <laughs> Well, I think actually Marsha should be answering this question. Um, I, I think we have experience that people, uh, seniors, did struggle with the Part D system. It, I would be with Sam mm -hmm. in saying this is a fantastic tool, but um, I think that we do have some pretty sound studies showing that it proved uh, pretty difficult. It's working, but they, they, an enormous percentage of seniors need help to navigate the system. Um, and I don't know, I, I actually think we should hear from Marsha. She's our expert. Do we have a floating mic out in the, uh, okay. Thanks, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think some of it relates to what you were saying where there's a whole educational process. Most consumers are not making choices, and if they are, they're not making them each year. They make it once when they go into a plan and they don't move. We don't know that entirely because the federal government doesn't really re release switching statistics, which is too bad, or the data to calculate them. But um, so it, it works because there are certain minimum requirements. We've learned that regulation's important. We've learned that you can end up in plans that do some things that you didn't know about and the federal government's been monitoring them and so that role mm -hmm. is important. Um, so you have to, most people are gonna go to the default. We've also learned that a small percentage of plans have almost all the people. We don't quite know why it's the big guys. It's always been the big guys. So I'm not sure how much competition or marketing there is. I think I was listening to your presentation and I think what you've done is much more sophisticated than Medicare Compare. I don't think the federal government's doing a good job there of trying to help consumers understand insurance because it all, they 
focus only on much more on premium and even the figures that are out there count the medicare premiums which don't matter with which plan you're in so your out of pocket costs are poor so i think we could have learned I, one thing that scares me is if the federal government which is so big and the medicare program which is so big can only do as well as they're doing how much how much what's going to be practical um, is what you're doing practical in 50 states? Is it practical with a lot of different choice scenarios? I mean, the fact that you have a lot of people all getting a constant set of choices makes it easier to collect information. So I think there is some things to learn from Medicare. Um, you know, people will end up in a plan if they have to. I mean, if they're already covered, they default to something. But I don't know, I think in an exchange environment where it involves a lot more proactive going in there and picking something as opposed to there being some default if you don't, you end up in fee for service or you end up in something, um, it's going to be a, it, it is a big challenge. Okay. Uh, take Carolyn just a second. Let me just ask one question in the interim. You can go right after this. That's the practical question. Who's going to do this? Who's going to pay for it? A lot of different models, but at a certain point, you have to have someone actually taking the reins or in a competitive environment who's going to come to the top and then who picks up the cost. Does it pass through directly to the insured? Oh, we can't do that. We'll have to hide it somewhere else. Or, or does the insurer pay? That, 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 that's a yet to be tested out. Well, model. don't we have the EU health insurance <laughs> model? I mean, well, we do have well, that one, which is. <laughs> we're paid by the carrier, the yeah, insurance carrier. Wouldn't that be right. a market test? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's one, uh, that's, that's one model, or uh, of course the states are uh, spending an enormous amount of model, uh, money now setting up their exchanges, and uh, one of our uh, disappointments is um, that it seems so far, and I hope this will change over time, but there's, the focus has been very heavily on the eligibility determination and the enrollment uh, processes and the sub moving subsidy money back and forth. We hope, because we're a consumer organization, that, that the focus will uh, come to be pretty soon on making sure that the thing that we talk about, which is making a market work for insurance, that it'll be, it will become focused on having a, a, facilita a market where consumers can make good choices. And, and, uh, and I don't think that's an overwhelming task. Uh, you know, in, in a sense, we, we, we do, uh, um, in the federal employees program, we have a couple of hundred plans, and we're comparing all them. Each market actually has a different set of plans, uh, and and uh, the checkbook model is, do, is 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 doing that. And I guarantee you, it's not the kind of money that <laughs> these states are putting out for some of these IT contractors, et cetera. Um, so, and 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 e health insurance even is is doing this in a lot of uh, a lot of markets and somehow making it work. So, uh, I, I think it's feasible. Uh, to do something and much more, uh, and, and it doesn't have to be an intimidating price tag. Okay. Yeah, I 100% agree with you that the, the emphasis so far in the exchanges to date has been eligibility systems and all this. And the reason is because the states aren't paying for it yet, right? The judgment day is going to come in 2015 when these things have to be self funded, and self funding is going to be how successful they are. And so if they don't get that consumer piece fixed by then, you know, there'll be a mad scramble then because that's the only way they're going to make money is people coming through it when, when they get to be self-funded. Okay, let's go to question. The usual drill, uh, identify yourself. Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician and an attorney. Um, I should say I'm also a federal widow. I've been widowed for 15 years, and I still have Blue Cross Blue Shield because that's what my husband chose. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I take a look at that 60-page book, um, and I just don't do anything which keeps me on Blue Cross Blue Shield. What I wanted to say was in answer to the question about Part D, someone did a study, I think it was Kaiser, but it was certainly presented at Kaiser, uh, that um, in fact the study showed that people didn't pick what would have been the quote unquote right plan for them under Part D, uh, so that they were paying more than they would have if they'd picked the quote unquote correct program. So. Uh, so we need something like this, and I think something that should be added is what the plan doesn't cover. Um, I mean, some of these things are like, at now, like uh, corporate reports, where the most important things are what's not there, 
the executive salary, the extra compensation, the stuff that's off the books. Um, I mean, there was a famous reporter whose brother was covered, who became unemployed, and he was getting private coverage year to year, um, and he got kidney failure, that's dialysis. And they said, oh, well, that was a pre-existing condition um, because, because your coverage for your last insurance policy stopped last year, and you got it last year, so you're only covered for the last five months. This is a new insurance policy this year, and so you're not covered. Um, and that was, she was from Time Magazine or something, so not, you know, not somebody with an interest to, not, not someone like me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's uh, Walt, uh, wait for the microphone. Walt Francis, I'm uh, one of the people behind this thing you've just seen. And you're not named Robert. <laughs> I'm not named Robert. That's why they don't let him on My the My father's name was Robert, though, so we, it, there is a close connection. <laughs> I just want to comment <laughs> on the study you mentioned. That, that's one of uh, uh, the, the very interesting study, and there's two ways to interpret it, because what John Gruber and others did in that study was they looked retrospectively at, at how well people in plan, Medicare Part D, plan A, B, C, you know, whatever number, how well it matched their actual drug expenditures post hoc. And he found that it, there was sort of 50%, you know, bit, there are a lot of percentages, I won't go into them. Most people weren't anywhere near the, quote, best plan for what actually happened to them. But th I, I regard that as a cup is half full versus empty issue. First place, the, a lot, the big tool for Medicare Part D is a known usage tool. I want to get back to, okay, put in the drugs you're taking today. <coughs> well, that's wonderful, and there is a lot of persistence, what's called persistence yeah. in drug spending. But the reality is your doctor may change your drug, okay, because it's not working out for you as well as it should. I keep flipping statins, but that drives me nuts. And then, but anyway, uh, so no one had perfect foresight. So I, don't, I think actually the results showed quite a good degree of sophistication and success. All right, guys, have another, okay, go ahead. Uh, identify uh, yourself. Mike, Mike Miller, I'm a physician, health policy consultant, and I want to follow up on both these because one of the key things about Medicare Part D during the debate, and I brought this up in an earlier meeting, is that the debate was always about, am I going to save money? How much am I going to save? Is it worth it to me? It was that actuarial value cal calculation. So I think it's great. Lynn brought in, what's the purpose of insurance? Mm -hmm. Because in this meeting at he the Health Affairs Journal this morning, there was a researcher who showed that people would pay, I think it was $2.60 for every dollar of insurance they would get were some very high cost things. They were, they were insuring themselves against the catastrophic. They were buying protection, which is really the basis of insurance. And I really feel that because Medicare Part D, has, the whole debate about it hasn't involved that, you're getting insurance, you're getting security, 10% of people who are eligible for Part D still aren't buying it, compared to 99 plus percent who buy Part B. Joe, help me out here. Joe Antos still around? 95. Probably. Part B? Yeah. Is that the older number? Five percent of people. Well, that's all combined. I mean, you've got Medicaid, but but you talk about folks who aren't picking up any Part B. I think the older number is it, it's uh, it's a little bit below ninety nine percent. That's what I'm saying. Well, it's like it's one per, one percent of people yeah. don't get Part B, whereas ten percent people are electing not to get Part D. So because they don't think it's a good deal, quote unquote, whereas it's clearly good insurance and it's subsidized. Um, so, I, and I think the checkbook. Well, you're switching from a commodity in drugs, which you can pretty much see the price and know what's out there, as opposed but, to. But you know, as you said, you don't know which, what disease you're going to get next mm -hmm. year, or if, or if you've got some disease and suddenly an expensive biologic gets approved, all of a sudden your costs go from ten hundred dollars a month to a thousand dollars a month. You, you can't see that coming. Yeah, you got a year oh. to wait. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think what I'm saying is the checkbook. What you guys are doing is great, and including that quality aspect is really key because that gets into the value proposition that's really the security issue with yeah. insurance. Okay. thought I saw another hand or two. Let's go in front, uh, Jane. Uh, I'm Jane Hold on a second. Mike's coming. Okay. I'm Jane. Was there. No. We need you. It's for the video. At, w at, with Blue Cross, and I think I'd be interested in your comments. I think we, you talked about um, the tool and being people to use it in five minutes. I think uh, was touched on a little bit, but I think one of the challenges of the exchange is that my understanding is a person will go on, put in their zip code, put in a lot of information, and then this 
Exchange Hub will bounce that information to Homeland Security, to the IRS, to a lot of other um, factors, and then come back and say, Jane Galvin is or is not eligible for a subsidy, uh, or is not, or should be in Medicaid. So there will be a lot of steps that these people will have to sort of go through before they actually get to the status where they will have to pick a plan. And you, t you know, you talk about losing people and that sort of thing. So I would be interested in your comments on um, how simple the initial exchanges should be, um, because there, this is. In, in Part D um, and in Medicare Advantage, those people knew that they were already eligible for that program. In the Federal Employees Program, you know you're already eligible for that program. But I think what will make the exchange so different is that you're going to have to wait for somebody to tell you if you're eligible. And then you're going to have to have the second level where somebody is going to have to say, yes, you're eligible with or without a subsidy. And obviously, the subsidy will also greatly influence um, the choice that you make. So to me, it's going to be a much different world um, because of the layers. So what would be your recommendations as to how simple, then, should we make the exchange when people get to that point of having to pick a health plan? So uh, oh, go ahead. Um, OK. Uh, I think what you're saying you know, come, uh, uh, reinforces the reason to have the plan choice part uh, be very quick and simple because the uh, because there will be those other steps before you get to the plan choice part obviously the more simple those can be made the better uh, but finally uh, you know we're if we're going to take f uh, five of their minutes those they're, they're, they, they they won't be the first five minutes they put in on this project and we better get them through those uh, that process as quickly as we can um, uh, as Robert pointed out, actually the nice thing is that even part of what looked like our five minutes here is not required because once they've come out of the eligibility part uh, and they come into this part that you know checkbook is uh, modeled, uh, they they um, uh, we already know their uh, their their age, um, we know their uh, family size, we know those uh, those key characteristics. Um, and, and so we can really almost immediately, uh, we, we take them to the doctor, you know, put, you choose your doctor uh, page. It, that's almost all it takes, unless they want to stop and we have to de decide how much time to put them into some other um, uh, 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 things that don't come out of the uh, eligibility part, such as uh, self-reported health status. If we stop them there, that is slowing them down a little bit, but does help with the prediction uh, if we give them uh, a choice of conditions to, 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 to go down a list of conditions that they can name. First of all, there are a lot of complexities in doing that right because pregnancies are all not the same, of course. Um, so there are reasons to be kind of careful about doing that anyway. Um, but but uh, th if we give them a list of you know, a couple hundred conditions to choose among, um, we've, we have, uh, we've cost them some time. And so these will have to be trade-offs, and they have to be tested trade-offs. I think there'll be quality measures. They just won't be required. any good. Yeah. I also think it, when we provided comments to HHS, um, I don't think it has to be a completely linear process. We argue that in order to not lose people, that there should be a pathway whereby they go ahead and look at their plan choices and, and begin to feel like some ownership, that they um, there's a plan here that they would like. In order to do that, we at least know the family composition. Um, and then you could say to them, now, you know, for your family of four, if your income is under X, you may be eligible for a subsidy. And, th and have them go in kind of after, but when they've sort of made a commitment to the system. So I don't think um, the only pathway is you do all this upfront eligibility calculation. In addition, you can always retrospectively, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who are either not eligible for a tax subsidy or only eligible for a very small one, and they, you know, they can still get it retrospectively if um, you know, they just want to go and buy paying up front. Okay. There's also been some um, schools of thought around this no wrong door. You're absolutely correct about the, the main exchange being this eligibility system first and then get vectored in one of these programs. Um, the uh, HHS came out with some rulings about a month ago that contemplated these uh, web-based entities, which means you can go the other way around. So 
if I think that I'm probably going to be an exchange plan kind of person, then I could go to a, well, an e-health insurance or a, you know, myhealthychoices.com, fill out some information there, look at some health plans, you know, maybe at the end of that process, you know, fill out some of the eligibility. It'll go ping the, the state database and then come back and say, well, yeah, you're eligible for this or no. Yeah, you may be eligible for Medicaid. Maybe you'll see some Medicaid web-based entities that said, the people that are in Medicaid probably have a good sense that that's probably where they are, so they may start there. With this no wrong door approach, I think you'll start to see some variances and maybe some entry points of the most likely place first and then get tested and, and then redirect you later. I mean, that's obviously to be determined, but I think what we have now is the flexibility to, to test out some of those different models. I think I saw a question in back. Yeah, this question is, my name Identify is Kevin. yourself, please. Uh, sorry, my name is Kevin. I'm an intern at the Heritage Foundation. Okay. Um, this question is for Mr. Krugoff. Um, your talk was very interesting, by the way, and it sh illustrated that it's possible to enable consumers to compare these insurance plans and providers, uh, thus basically putting these plans in a competition with each other. Theoretically, this competition should reduce prices. Do you have any evidence of that? Um. We, uh, there is some, there is some, uh, it relates it, to other structural elements. Yeah, it, yeah, in terms of the, of the overall market, I can't say. We have, people certainly do, uh, um, we have evidence that people will go to lower cost plans. Yeah. Whether that causes the, uh, whether that causes the plans, uh, that's enough incentive for the plans to uh, uh, be more efficient. Um, and for the whole system, a much more complicated question, for the whole system, to be more efficient over time, um, uh, well, I, I, you know, I, I guess I don't have good evidence. Do you? Uh, would, what's your answer to that, Walt? Would you? I wrote a book about that. Question. Yeah. Well. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> the better one must have been published by AEI. <laughs> this is a different book. This is the AEI book, not a checkbook book. Uh, I, there's no very good evidence. Let me say that first on, on this category of question, but there's lots of bits and pieces. For example, we have the experience of Part D coming in 40% below the budget levels projected both by the actuaries at CMS and by the Congressional Budget Office. That's a huge discrepancy. They didn't and ask fortune tellers, though, at the time. Yeah, so. Uh, so, so that clearly has been very successful competitive market, uh, benchmarked against some predictions made by some very sophisticated uh, forecasters tells us something about how good forecasters are. FDHCP hasn't had any forecasters like this. The study I did showed that over the last roughly 30 years, the FDHPP, this very clumsy and in many respects not well designed competitive plan system, has outperformed Medicare in controlling costs. Okay? That's uh, Medicare is managed, micromanaged, detailed, micro micromanaged by some of the smartest people in the country. Uh, and they can't beat the FDHPP run by the Federal Government's Personnel Office. You know, I mean, it's sort of very, but the problem is there's a lot of, it turns out there's a lot of inertia in health insurance choices that's been alluded to by several people. Very important. It actually helps promote some stability in, in health insurance markets, okay, when people don't jump from one plan to another to save 10 bucks next year. Uh, the FHEP has not done nearly as well as it could have and should have had the model been designed slightly differently. All right, I think we're uh, close to the end of our five-minute allowance for your attention span. Uh, <laughs> once again, we've struggled uh, with the opposing uh, forces of the soft bigotry of low expectations for consumers and high expectations for regulated choices, but I'm sure we'll end up somewhere in the middle as we usually do in this country. Uh, I might point out that uh, there's all kinds of stuff to give to people when they sign up for home mortgages that gets, goes right into the trash bin. Uh, and moves through settlement, and yet somehow people buy and sell houses. And, and the most, well and the and the <laughs> most dangerous choices ahead of us involve elections, where apparently we'll let anybody vote without any information whatsoever at the last minute. And we managed to overcome that. So we can probably do better in health insurance and health care, but we've set the bar relatively low, and we could certainly exceed it. But please thank our speakers for a wonderful set of presentations. Thank you for your questions.